we're going to start with the performer's mindset. This way, you'll be prepared, psychologically and emotionally, to perform in ways that stir the heart and inspire action. In order to do this, your desire to perform needs to be stronger than your fear of criticism or failure. Your voice must be powerful and in tune with your values and beliefs, and you'll need to know how to play the right role in every situation. Once you've read through this first part of the book and adopted the performer's mindset, you'll see performance from a different, more empowering perspective and you'll be on your way to stealing the show during the most important high stakes. Situations of your life Find your voice The most common missing element in the thousands of presentations and performances I've witnessed is the speaker's true voice. But finding your voice can be difficult for many people in business and life, even for those building careers as top executives, thought leaders, or performers. Here's an illustration of why finding and trusting your voice matters even to advanced speakers. A client of mine appeared on a major broadcast network, and her program excelled in numerous ways. However, during the first segment, I noticed that she was apologizing for telling parts of her life story along the lines of I'm sorry for sharing about myself again, or I apologize for sharing this. I chatted with her during the break and told her she was doing great. She asked if I had any notes for her. So I offered, how would you feel about doing away with all of your apologies for sharing? You're on the stage to share. That's why you're there. Apologizing for sharing is a way of saying you're sorry for your own voice. Research has shown that women tend to apologize more than men. Two studies by the University of Waterloo in Ontario and published in the journal Psychological Science in 2010 found that while men are just as willing as women to apologize, they have a higher threshold for what they feel they need to apologize. 4. My client agreed to try dropping the unneeded apologies and we talked about how anyone, including the two of us, can get caught in the perfection trap, wondering if we're worthy of the moment. In public speaking or, say, during the interview process for a new job, it's easy to get distracted and start questioning yourself, what can I say that hasn't already been said? What can I do that hasn't already been done? Why should I be here rather than someone else? Finding your true voice can help you realize that none of those questions are as important as how you say what you say to put into perspective the personal journey that raised those doubts along the way. So what is finding your true voice? For starters, it's about letting go of your inner critic, the voices in your head telling you you're not good enough, don't know enough, and don't have enough. It's about saying goodbye, thanks for sharing, to those inner voices carping that you might not be ready qualified, or worthy of the next opportunity. Letting go of thinking you don't have enough to offer is an incredibly rewarding aspect of what I am sharing in this book. It allows you to embrace your gifts so you have the confidence and natural conviction that you can get results from your performances and speeches. Even if you're saying something that's already been said, it's your voice that matters. You don't have to be different to make a difference. How many mothers sing the same lullabies to their children? A baby doesn't care half as much about the song as she does about the sound of her mother's voice. Perhaps you are blessed with sturdy self-esteem, feel like you were born to stand in the spotlight, and don't second-guess your performances. If so, feel free to keep your Superman costume. I suppose it comes easy for a lucky few. Of course, it might just be bravado, the way you tell the difference is by assessing whether or not you continually raise the stakes and allow yourself to be comfortable with discomfort. Finding your voice is important for your results. If you want to play different roles authentically and amplify or downplay different parts of your personality to do so, it's important to be comfortable with who you really are and what you stand for so you never lose sight of your values. Too often, when you are given any opportunity to be in the spotlight, you get scared and lose the sense of being authentic and performing in the moment. Instead, you play at what you think a person in that situation is supposed to be like. As a result, you believe that you're an imposter. However, by learning how to be yourself when you perform, while also embracing the fact that you can be a chameleon who plays lots of different roles with different styles of behavior, you will become a powerful performer and speaker. It might seem like a contradiction, be yourself, but also be a chameleon. 
F. Scott Fitzgerald saw the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function as the sign of a well-developed intelligence. I suspect you have that ability. So, please, for the time being, just hold this idea in your head that you can play different roles and still be authentic. The payoff will be the discovery of the abilities, strengths, and enthusiasm that you possess as a performer. Some of us will, at times, add on layers of personae to gain others' approval while hiding parts of ourselves that we think are embarrassing. Authenticity really comes down to this question. Do you have the courage to talk about who you really are, not just who you want others to think you are? This is different than sharing inappropriate information or unnecessary historical details. It's important to listen actively, to be curious about others, and to have a sense of proportion about how much you talk about yourself. We don't need to know the details of Sam's late-night rendezvous or how Susie feels like she isn't worthy of the promotion she received. The former is inappropriate and something that Sam should keep private. The latter is self-destructive and should be discussed only with trusted mentors and advisors in order to overcome it. Susie could lose credibility with her subordinates if she discusses it with them. At the same time, many extraordinarily successful people learn how to own the key elements of their backstory and make them part of their public personality and statements. In the right circumstances, when you're open about your weaknesses, differences, or difficulties, people find you more approachable and they will connect at a deeper level with your message. We've seen in our own social history how accountability to personal truths propels a talented person to new levels. Robin Roberts' career at ABC gained new clarity and credibility when she opened up about being gay. Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg's success as the author of the best-selling book Lean In and the movement it spurred was due to her ability to communicate her own conflicts around children, intimacy, and marriage to women from vastly different backgrounds. She was willing to share that she doesn't have it all figured out. It was Howard Schultz's openness about the destructiveness of his own overreaching ambition that kicked off the Starbucks reboot that took place in 2008. The Fear of Being Found Out This first part of the book will help you master the inner game of performance. You want to improve as a performer and speaker. You're committing to being authentic to your personal biography and style. Perhaps you've identified areas for improvement, such as nervousness, a lack of imagination, boring content, stiffness, predictability, lack of humor. Those issues are personal to you. Maybe you've identified childhood experiences that affected your self-image and self-esteem as a performer, such as the criticism of a parent or a sibling who was more of a natural performer and intimidated you. Perhaps you were an outsider in high school and internalized that sense of not belonging in the spotlight. Your supervisor or peers may have negatively critiqued a performance or presentation and it has stuck with you for years. These stories are not uncommon. They're universal. They feed the anxiety about performing that is also universal. The biggest issue isn't nerves, that's normal. But these negative filters turn your perspective inward. When it comes to a high-stakes business performance, you might fear you'll be found out for not having what it takes, for being a fraud in a suit. Not fraud as in con man. But, rather, fraud as in people will find out you're not the confident, expert leader you're pretending to be. Isn't that why it's such a big relief when a potential performance is canceled or postponed? Phew. They won't find me out this time. I don't want you to get stuck in the rut of performing so you're not found out. And I don't think you do either. Steal the Show is about delivering big results for you and your career. It's not about getting approval or keeping your head down or doing just enough to stay in your job. You can't perform your way into universal job protection. Perform to win. Perform to achieve business goals by trusting your preparation and your true persona. Freeing your natural voice. There are important behaviors that open the way to freeing your voice and finding a sense of self-esteem and self-possession as a performer. These include finding out what it takes to discover your backstory and keeping your promises to your audience, whomever and wherever they may be. Letting go of the pernicious small thoughts that maintain the illusion that your voice shouldn't be heard. Escaping the perfection trap and embracing your role as a performer. 
never again being trapped by your history or anyone else's. Embracing your audience with love. I admire the pioneering work of teacher, author, and psychotherapist Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. His definition of self-esteem is one that I aspire to as an individual and suggest that my students consider as well. Self-esteem is the disposition to experience oneself as being competent to cope with the basic challenges of life and as being worthy of happiness. Thus, it consists of two components. One, self-efficacy, confidence in one's ability to think, learn, choose, and make appropriate decisions. And two, self-respect. Confidence that love, friendship, achievement, success, and a word, happiness, are natural and appropriate. Knowing when your voice is already there. A big advantage of the performing techniques and strategies in this book, and of rehearsing them properly, is that you will strengthen these two types of confidence, self-efficacy, and self-respect, and starve the inner nags of the oxygen they need. This has worked for many of my students, including Lori, a CPA who attended one of my events in 2013. Lori doesn't possess a big, charismatic performer's personality. Rather, she's a quiet, reserved number cruncher. Lori told me she was fearful of speaking in public and enrolled in the event because she needed to find her voice and have more confidence in meetings and at professional conferences. During the seminar, Lori found it hard to hold center stage with confidence or project her voice more than a few feet. I saw her hands shaking as she clutched her note cards. When I snuck up on her and took the cards away, Lori cursed me under her breath. I was both shocked and delighted by Lori's response. Most of all, however, I could hardly wait to see what she would do next. Without her cards to hide behind, Lori addressed her fears of public speaking and challenges with making herself heard for what might have been the first time. She shared that she'd been hiding most of her life. The one time she tried to speak up as a child, her mother slapped her across the face and said, No one wants to hear from you. That one moment shut her up for over 40 years. In a seminar that included professional speakers, she was the only student who brought the room to tears with her speech. Lori overcame her fears by investing herself in a method that freed her from her past and allowed her to find her own voice in the present. The accomplished actress Jamie Lee Curtis found a whole new voice in writing and speaking about addiction and recovery. She claims her 15 years of sobriety as her greatest achievement. Her blog, Good Morning Heartache, Good Morning Life on the Huffington Post is regularly shared and retweeted by thousands. Former actress and mental health expert Kathy Cronkite, Walter's daughter, went public with her struggles living with severe depression, leaving her career as an actress to become a popular, influential advocate for mental health treatment. Now she is a popular keynote speaker. You see, finding your voice isn't necessarily a matter of adding things. It's certainly not about becoming someone else. Maybe it's not a matter of finding it at all, but rather just the opposite. Maybe it's about stripping away the false personae and excesses since your voice is already there. It's about returning to who you were before you started believing other people's stories about you. It's you. It's your core. Don't talk yourself out of success. Don't let your voice be trapped by history. The past doesn't have to predict whether or not you will have success. So many people talk themselves out of their dreams because they've had letdowns in the past. That's a common pitfall. For example, Frederick Banting, who won the 1923 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discovery of insulin's ability to control diabetes in humans, said in his later years that, if he had been more familiar with the literature and the long history of unsuccessful attempts to isolate the hormone, he might never have undertaken the research that was ultimately successful. I feel similarly about writing books. If I have too many other voices or points of view in my head, I start questioning myself or I write in response to what others are saying. Neither of these situations is how I'd like to spend my time. And I certainly don't want to censor myself and not write about a concept that is central to my methodology because someone else has already addressed it. Of course, I read and pay attention to the world around me. I don't lock myself in a dark room and avoid the world in order to find my voice. But, when it comes time to create, I trust my voice. And you should too. 
The problem with fixating on other people's histories of failed expectations is that it makes you think small and play small. The notion that being realistic or practical means settling for less is a small idea that robs you of your voice. It is realistic and practical for you to do big things. Eleanor Roosevelt said, The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. For our work together, think of it like this. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams and have the willingness to find their voice and confidently and proudly share it with others. Puncturing the Perfection Myth Trusting your voice means that you rehearse and perform to achieve your goals, communicate a big idea, and get results. It doesn't mean you set out even subconsciously to prove you're better than other speakers or to make the audience like you. By making your goals unrealistic and unattainable, you'll start playing small and diminishing your voice and presence. When you are in the spotlight, yes, many people are looking to you for answers. But that doesn't mean you must have all the answers. You just need to be able to deliver on your promise. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to present and deliver compelling content in a speech, effectively lead a brainstorming session, or even get chosen for a leadership position. Sometimes the way to increase your status in the eyes of others is to say, I don't know. The one who thinks she always knows what's best is usually the last one to be asked for her opinion. As I mentioned earlier, what you say doesn't have to be different to make a difference. It's the way you say it that matters. Your particular voice connects with some people and not with others. For example, if you sit on a conference panel, you might be drawn into competition over whether you will speak first, last, or in the middle of a program. Yes, often the first one to voice her opinion can set the tone. There are times when finding your voice after you hear what others have to say, in a meeting, is the most powerful choice. It resonates the strongest and reverberates the loudest. So, sometimes, the first one to take the stage is the last one remembered. When your voice is the strongest. As you advance into my methodology, consider this, to be exposed when you are performing is where your true strength resides. When you think you have to protect yourself from getting hurt, from the power of others to adversely affect your life, all you have really done is repress your dreams. You have wasted your voice on self-protection rather than amplifying it through self-understanding followed by self-expression. All that negativity makes you weak. Your voice is strong when it is founded on generosity and, dare I say it, love. In fact, I suggest trying to love every member of your audience even if they're thumbing their noses at you. When you're given the stage or any kind of platform, like the head of the table at Thanksgiving dinner, it's an honor. Call me corny, but that's the way I see it. Later in the book, I'll discuss how to get the audience to respect you even before you stand in front of them. That's when your voice is the strongest. Finding your voice and speaking up probably shouldn't be a rebellious act. It's empowerment, not revolt. It's not a response to something. It's not I'm going to show them just watch me. To rebel is an action fueled by scarcity. It's a small voice shouting. Finding and sharing your voice is about creating something new, not simply complaining or rebelling against something in the past. The exciting performer breaks the rules, not just to be rebellious, but to create something new, something that works better than what currently exists, and to delight, surprise, enthrall, move, and inspire. The act of tearing something down without rebuilding something better in its place traps us in the past rather than freeing us to experience the rewards of the future. Play the right role in every situation. I always am in a role, lovely, for you, for them, even for myself. Yeah. Even when I'm alone, I am still in a role, and I myself am the most exacting audience I have ever had. Simona Panova, author of Nightmarish Sacrifice, many of the world's greatest leaders, along with effective people from all walks of life, know how to play different yet still authentic roles that help them fit in with many diverse groups of people. In scenarios of all kinds. Whether you're preparing for a presentation, being promoted, being reassigned to a new position, or finding that you have grown stagnant in your current life or business circumstances, discovering how to play different roles and to adopt new styles of behavior powers up your creativity and confidence. 
Playing the right role is about identifying how you fit into a given scenario and stealing the show when you do. This chapter will help you develop new skills to present, pitch, and perform based on your strengths and interests. It's about building on who you are, what you stand for, and what you already do, and doing it for a purpose. When you're playing the right roles, you are persuasive in those roles because they are authentic to you. And amplifying the most positive, powerful, and compelling parts of your personality really is quite fun. However, and this may seem contradictory, if you stay rigidly fixed on what you see as your true self, you might not realize that you can adopt different styles of behavior and still be authentic. I've spoken for many years on this concept of adapting your style of behavior in all aspects of life to meet the needs of different situations. It's what an actor does, and it's been a key to my success. I found the January 2015 Harvard Business Review article by Herminia Ibarra about how this concept applies to leadership to be important. As we strive to improve our game, a clear and firm sense of self is a compass that helps us navigate choices and progress toward our goals. But when we're looking to change our game, a too rigid self-concept becomes an anchor that keeps us from sailing forth. People who are able to adopt different styles of behavior to suit the dynamics of a given situation are comfortable adjusting their style to different situations without feeling fake or pretending to be something they're not. It's like being a chameleon, which is different than playing roles where you pretend to be something you're not or know something you don't. Take that too far and you might start spinning the truth or even misleading people. With that said, when attempting to wow an audience, close a deal, or pitch an idea, we win when we present the best parts of ourselves, but not every part of ourselves. We succeed when we amplify the parts of our personalities that match the needs of the moment and we set aside, but don't hide, the parts of ourselves that don't. By contrast, people who are fixated on one value system, one way of being, tend to express what they think and feel, even when it runs counter to situational demands. Doing so is not always necessary. It can be a demonstration of rigidity, the need to be right, the inability to improvise as needed, or even an intolerance of other perspectives or styles of behavior. As a result, the folks who feel compelled to express what they think and feel even when it's not appropriate for the given circumstance often have trouble performing the role required in new situations, such as moving from middle management into a leadership position, from employee to entrepreneur, from associate to partner, or even from single to married or vice versa. Yes, I know this concept can be confounding, but if you're willing to entertain the idea that you can authentically play different roles and adopt different styles of behavior to easily glide from one scenario to another and one group of people to another, you may have access to opportunities that previously weren't available to you. Successful and effective people will often play different roles to suit the situation. They're willing to experiment with playing different roles until they become comfortable with the new behaviors or attitudes required to play their new parts. Eventually, each role fits them authentically and brings out their strengths. Understanding how roles work. The first principle for learning how you play the right role is to emphasize some parts of your personality and de-emphasize other parts, depending on what the professional or personal circumstance calls for. However, if you play the same role in every situation, you may cause conflict, alienate people, and limit your ability to excel. Take the Marine Corps Battalion leader. He may feel that he has to stay in character even when he's playing the role of father to his young girls. Staying in the role of soldier, he creates a home atmosphere of intensity and rigidity that creates anxiety in his daughters. Imagine if a stand-up comedian wanted to produce and direct a big-budget film but couldn't turn off his class clown style of behavior in meetings with Hollywood executives. Do you think they'd take him seriously enough to let him manage all that money? On the other hand, a college professor who understands this concept may play the role of entertaining and kindly grandfather in the classroom while taking on a much tougher role with his most talented graduate students because he wants to push them to higher levels of excellence. In my case, the role I play as a mentor to my clients is far different than the role I play as a student at my jiu-jitsu school. But they are equally authentic. You will recognize me in both roles. Tim Cook, 
the CEO of Apple, had already mastered a number of different roles as Steve Jobs' chief operating officer. Cook coached divisions and led division heads worldwide. He cultivated and educated major retail customers, and he interacted and communicated with Jobs. When Cook became CEO of Apple, he had to learn new roles, particularly that of being the company's public spokesperson and leader of its brand. Cook now introduces Apple products in closely scrutinized presentations and meets with the most influential business and financial media. These are roles Steve Jobs once played. On October 30th, 2014, Cook did a brilliant take on a new role, a gesture that resonated worldwide. In an article published in Bloomberg Business Week, Tim Cook speaks up. He did something quite rare for a CEO. He auditioned for a new role and performed it brilliantly. Cook announced that he was gay and said it was one of the greatest gifts God gave me. Cook wrote that he did not hide his orientation. Most people at Apple knew and treated it as a mundane matter. He acknowledged that because so much of his life at Apple kept him in the spotlight, it was important to him to preserve a private sphere of his life. However, Cook found a role that was calling to him, that of socially responsible citizen. He saw that the prominence of his position, particularly as a white male CEO in a global technology brand, offered him the opportunity to provide an example that could inspire, comfort, and perhaps even protect others. He didn't do this for the stock price or to get an edge on Apple's competitors. He used the article to articulate and assume a role others hadn't expected he'd play. And the response from the LGBT community, investors, the business community, customers, vendors, fans, press, and even many political and religious leaders was overwhelmingly positive. Cook wrote the lines for his, true, character to play in this new role. I don't consider myself an activist, but I realize how much I've benefited from the sacrifice of others. So if hearing that the CEO of Apple is gay can help someone struggling to come to terms with who he or she is, or bring comfort to anyone who feels alone, or inspire people to insist on their equality, then it's worth the trade-off with my own. Privacy I have no doubt that a career that consisted of playing many different leading roles helped Cook prepare for this moment, but I'm sure it still required rehearsal. Cook even acknowledged how he plays different roles. I'm an engineer, an uncle, a nature lover, a fitness nut, a son of the South, a sports fanatic, and many other things. Here's a different kind of example. Many coaches, from Herb Brooks to Phil Jackson, also play roles that help them get inside their players' heads and motivate them to perform. Phil Jackson plays the Zen master role to near perfection. He talks to the media, writes books, and sprinkles into talks with players and coaches his understanding of Eastern philosophy and psychology and how it applies to winning at the mental game of playing basketball in the NBA. Most people of a certain age remember the miracle on ice and the improbable victory of the United States men's ice hockey team over the Soviet Union in the 1980 Winter Olympics. What you may not know is that the U.S. team's coach, Herb Brooks, consciously developed a role as part of his strategy to compete. As a coach at the University of Minnesota, Brooks's coaching persona was that of a nice guy who supported his players. In coaching the U.S., Olympic team, however, he played an entirely different role. Knowing that the players he selected came from different college programs and had been rivals on the ice, he needed to break them down before bringing them together. How did he accomplish this feat? Brooks became a demanding drill sergeant of a coach who pushed the players through all-night skating drills, effectively bringing them together by making them hate Brooks and his harsh style more than they hated each other. By the time they reached the Olympics, the players had bonded over their experiences and felt unified as a team. Brooks took a big risk in playing that role, but it paid off. I'm sure there are many other examples you can think of from leaders you've admired. There are several benefits of learning how to master role-playing. You will become more confident because you have a plan and the right roles for optimizing your performance. Become more adept as a communicator as you learn new insights to draw on. Learn more about yourself and your capacity to inspire and motivate. The ability to adopt different styles of behavior and step into the right role in every situation is a potent tool for change. 
It's a behavior you may already use from time to time with some effectiveness, whether you realize it or not. The question is, do you want to grow and gain the value from employing this approach intentionally? I hope so. When you start identifying the roles you'd like to play and you open up to new styles of behavior, you move from supporting roles into leading roles. Are you going to play a leading or a supporting role in your life? Let's explore the kinds of roles you want to play in your life and discuss how you can excel at them. These can range from long-term, big dream roles such as being a CEO to narrower, get it done soon roles such as best sales closer. Perhaps you'd like to be more of a leading man at home, but less of a general at work. There are some instances where you might want to take the leading role and other instances when you're more effective in a supporting role. There is a difference between being in the limelight and hogging the limelight. Keep two important points in mind. 1. When you take on a new role, there may be loved ones, friends, or colleagues who aren't comfortable with your new role and prefer you in your old role. Here's an example. A friend of mine left a stable job as an art teacher because she wanted to make more money and collaborate with people doing cutting-edge work. She started dating a man just before she quit and took a job as a designer at an ad agency. Although her new boyfriend said he supported the move, the new corporate role made him uncomfortable. My friend wanted to become a serious achiever and gain more independence. Apparently, her boyfriend had different plans for her. This next statement is a bold one, so I don't expect you to agree with me right off the bat, but there may be some people you should drop from your life. I believe that, if the people around you hold you back from playing new and different roles, roles that serve your dreams, those people need to go. I know that sounds harsh, it's rarely a simple proposition, and yes, some of the unsupportive people we are tied to by blood, but you get one shot at this life and it's your life to live, isn't it? Share it with others, but don't let them write your life story and cast you as a supporting character. You are the writer, director, and star of your own life. 2. Be honest with yourself as you go through the process. Continually ask if you are trying to achieve your real goals or just trying to get people to approve of you. For example, you may be trying to play the role of champion on your corporate team. Playing that role would make you more visible and give you a higher status in the organization, among your peers, and even in your family. However, it's important for you to remember why you are doing this work. Is it what you really want for your long-term success, or is it something you're doing for the immediate approval of the people you work with or a family member or even the Joneses next door? You can always draw upon your collection of roles for daily life and for important performances once you have become skilled at them. They become part of your repertoire as a manager, leader, entrepreneur, parent, lover, or head of the PTA. What do you need to do to play the ideal roles you have just identified? This brings us to the next important question. What do you need to do to play the roles you aspire to? What kinds of performances will you be called upon to make in this role, and how will you prepare for those moments? Here's an example from my previous career. When I left acting almost 20 years ago, I was searching for my next step. At the time, I raced road bikes, and I was teaching an indoor cycling class as a way to train during the off-season. I loved exercise, and with my background as an actor, I was good at creating motivating and theatrical experiences for the students in my class, again, playing a role. I heard there was an open position for a group fitness manager who would be responsible for hiring, creating programming, and signing and managing the fitness instructors at one of the club locations. I saw myself in this role. I also had some new ideas for programming and a theory about why I would excel in the position. There was just one problem. I lacked any of the certifications or experience the position supposedly required. To impress Tony, the director of the department, who had to approve me for the key interview with the vice president of the fitness division, I used my acting training to imagine myself as the perfect group exercise manager with tons of fresh ideas. I chose parts of my backstory to support my theory as to why I would excel in this position. I rehearsed how I'd present my case, and I had strong, clear motivation that I would share with them. I wanted to make group exercise the most profitable and fun division of the company. At the time, it was just considered a corporate overhead. 
I also amped up my motivation to get that job by thinking, if I don't get this, I won't be able to pay any of my bills, no self-respecting woman will ever be willing to date me, and I'll end up a balding, not prospects punchline. Turns out I couldn't really avoid the balding part. I sat down with Tony and asked her to look at what I had done in my acting career. I explained that in the same way actors work to create memorable experiences for the audience, a group exercise class can create experiences for the participating club members. I would use my dramatic skills and theatrical know-how to make the classes more surprising and delightful. I also demonstrated that my experience with theater production was all about project management. That is, I had experience organizing people and budgets against a timeline to produce an event. And finally, I told her that my training as an actor and an acting teacher made me good at identifying and developing talent as I went about hiring fitness class leaders, the best of which are natural performers. I also pitched my theory that they were hiring the wrong characters for what the roles actually required. They were hiring top fitness teachers to be managers because of their good records in attracting students, but they weren't looking for candidates with much in the way of natural management sensibilities. Taking a chance, I told Tony, I have an abundance of these natural talents. I should mention that I was nervous the entire time. I don't want you to think that I just skated through the entire process. There was a lot riding on this interview and I was way outside my comfort zone. Fortunately, my training as an actor gave me the ability to control my breath and body language. A good performer can appear to be at ease in the face of great pressure, even with anxiety flowing through his veins. Tony was impressed and agreed to move me to the next step, an interview with the senior vice president of the whole division. And get this, she gave me the company's procedures manual to help me speak the language I needed to develop for my character. I studied ferociously and adopted the language from the procedures manual to fit the role I wanted to play. I got the big job after my performance in the second interview. Shortly thereafter, I was given the opportunity to add a second club to my roster along with a salary bump of $5,000. I thanked them for the offer but declined, explaining that the math didn't make sense. It was double the work for a tiny increase in pay. This surprised them because people in the industry were usually motivated by status and approval and were willing to sacrifice themselves to get it. So I played the role of dealmaker, wrote a simple script, and made a counteroffer, one with a huge risk for me. Which three goals, if accomplished within the next three months, would make you the happiest? I asked the bosses. When they told me, I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll take on this second club, and if I accomplish those goals within three months, you'll double my salary. If I don't accomplish the goals, I'll take the 5,000. First, there was silence in the room, followed by laughter and even a bit of snickering. But they agreed, clearly thinking I'd never succeed. You know I wouldn't be telling you this story if the ending wasn't a happy one. I doubled my salary, and just three months after that, because I had another success while playing the role of renegade entrepreneur, I was promoted to director of the division with yet another salary increase. That's three promotions and almost three times my original salary within six months. So, here are the most important steps in that experience. 1. I got clear on my super objective and my motivation to achieve it. 2. I decided on the role I would play, then I thought and acted as if I already was the great manager I'd envisioned using my imagination. 3. Then I drew on my backstory to fill in the role and find my voice, and I did research with the employee manual. 4. I took huge but achievable risks by making what seemed to be outsized promises while also getting things done under the radar. 5. I also stayed in the moment to discover what they really wanted and needed. 6. I developed relationships with people who had my back and helped me accomplish my goals. The final consideration lies in learning about your role by studying the best performers that you can observe. Just as athletes improve by practicing the shot or swing of their idol in countless repetitions, this approach can work in business roles and performances. If you see a star in a role you admire, say, the master networker, study what she does and decide what is comfortable for you to try. This doesn't mean you should pretend to be someone else. It means learn and practice the techniques of a master performer, just as you would in graduate school or at a seminar.
What roles do you aspire to? Would you like to move into more leading roles? If so, what kinds of performances will you be called upon to play in those roles, and do you have the courage to step into the spotlight and steal the show when you do? Crush your fears and silence the critics. According to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Does that sound right? This means, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Jerry Seinfeld Having fears about performing in public high-stakes situations is absolutely natural. This stuff can be scary. I regularly have scary moments myself. It's how we deal with the scary stuff that helps define who we are and how well we succeed. Our fears can be about looking stupid, making mistakes, failing, or even just showing others that we're nervous. Ultimately, we're afraid of being criticized or ridiculed. And maybe, deep, we're also afraid of truly revealing ourselves. If someone rejects our half-hearted attempt, they haven't really rejected us, right? But if we are vulnerable and give everything we have, and we are rejected, whoa. What does that say about who we really are and what we're actually capable of achieving? I think it's what we most want, to be known, warts and all, and still be respected and loved. It's natural to worry about, obsess over, or dread your next presentation, speech, interview, networking event, or even a blind date. Maybe you wrestle with questions about how to prepare. Perhaps you lie awake at night thinking about what your boss or best client will say about your next performance. It's natural to worry about how to handle public speaking situations that go wrong or even, heaven forbid, bomb. Even if these moments are relatively scarce for you, you'll benefit from this chapter, wherein I address the twin roots of the fear of public speaking, uncertainty, and the fear of being criticized. There are two types of criticism that will shut you down or make you play small, the internal kind that comes from the voices of judgment that run rampant in your brain, and the external kind that comes from members of an audience, your peers, or your superiors. As much as we'd like to avoid them, we are always going to face the external fault finders. But we don't have to play that role ourselves and become our own worst critics. Silencing the internal critic. Our brains do a great job of running repeating loops of how things will go wrong when we take the stage and step up to the mic, literally or figuratively. These images and voices typically come to us from our childhood because the criticism and doubts of our parents and caregivers leave deeper tracks in our minds than many of the other judges we encounter later in life, though these can come back to us as well. However, the more you pay attention to this negative chatter, the more you hear it because fear activates your stress responses. Let's circle back to Lori, whose story I told in Chapter 1. Lori was the shy CPA who enrolled in one of my workshops in 2013 and ultimately had the courage to speak openly about her childhood, its effect on her confidence, and her desire for change. Her speech ended up bringing down the house. Lori's voice was liberated by her accountability and honest backstory. I had taken away her note cards so she couldn't rely on the story she'd been telling for years, which wasn't her true voice. She had to let go of the shame associated with how her mother had treated her and the false self she created as armor against that pain. Secondly, Lori had the courage to keep the promise she'd made to herself, to me, and to her peers when she enrolled in the event. She had promised to do the work to become a better speaker and find her voice. And she kept that promise. Lori's positive experience, bolstered by the encouraging and supportive crowd, is a source of confidence that enables her to share her voice more and more. In so doing, her voice will continue to grow and change. Eventually, she'll be telling a new story in a voice that is simultaneously the same and different than the one she found that day. Because she's removed this block and silenced her inner critic, she's on to a new lesson, a new story, perhaps even a new audience. Silencing the negative voices in your head is directly tied to finding the different, but all authentic, characters you can play. Throughout the book, I will continue to help you silence your internal voices of doubt, because, ultimately, isn't that the secret to successful performance in all parts of your life? If the voices in your head put you down, make you feel small, or tell you that you're not good enough, it's not likely you'll get too far. 
However, if the voices in your head are positive, encouraging, and supportive, telling you that you absolutely are capable of achieving your goals and dreams, you will do just that. Silencing the external critics Stepping into the spotlight comes with taking the chance that you'll be criticized. Just ask Bruno Mars. The pop performer had been chosen to headline the halftime show at the 2014 Super Bowl. Part of Mars's big moment had to do with predictions building up to the performance, creating an atmosphere of anticipation that offers some instructive lessons for anyone about to experience a major speech or presentation. Prior to this most anticipated and watched event emerged a plethora of online media discussions, a charitable description of the pregame vitriol surrounding Mars' selection, bashing Mars as a baby-faced lightweight not ready for prime time. Never mind his immense popularity, a recent Grammy for Best Pop Album, or a concert tour that grossed $72.4 million. For critics, the fact that Bruno Mars wasn't a tested commodity on a Super Bowl scale was enough to pass judgment. He wasn't, after all, a universally anointed music industry giant on par with Bruce, Beyonce, Madonna, or McCartney. In other words, Bruno Mars wasn't a safe choice, and that made some observers antsy. When asked about the controversy around the selection at a news conference, Bruno said, No matter where I perform, it's my job to uplift the people. So whether I'm performing at a graduation party, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, the Grammys, or the Super Bowl, I'm going to give it all I got. Whatever happens, happens. That's your job, to uplift the people. Let other people pontificate on whether what you're doing is going to be a career breaker or career maker. The great performer knows that's a false either slash or. He will take the risk because the bigger the risk and the higher the stakes, the greater the opportunity to create something exciting, moving, meaningful, shocking, and inspiring. The performer knows how easy it is to criticize, so there is no point in sorting through it all. You'll be well served if you simply do your best and care more about the quality of your work than pre-performance applause or the apoplectic antagonists. Adina Menzel played the role of Elsa in Frozen, the most successful animated movie in history. She also originated the role of Elphaba in Wicked and Maureen in Rent on Broadway. She might be one of the most talented and hard-working musical performers in modern history. To celebrate the new year of 2015, Menzel was asked to give a live performance of the theme song from Frozen in Times Square, NYC. And, boy, was it ever. On that frigid night, temperatures were below freezing, more than one million people crowded the streets, and tens of millions more watched at home. She performed beautifully until she reached for the last note. Twitter blew up with angry critics panning her performance and ridiculing her. In response to the criticism, Menzel simply pointed the naysayers to something she'd said a few months prior. There are about three million notes in a two-and-a-half-hour musical. Being a perfectionist, it took me a long time to realize that if I'm hitting 75% of them, I'm succeeding. Performing isn't only about the acrobatics and the high notes. It's staying in the moment, connecting with the audience in an authentic way, and making yourself real to them through the music. I am more than the notes I hit, and that's how I try to approach my life. You can't get it all right all the time, but you can try your best. If you've done that, all that's left is to accept your shortcomings and have the courage to try to overcome them. She gets it. She's not just successful because of her talent. She's also successful because she is willing to do the work and silence the critics with her attitude, all in service of the audience and her art. Sure, the critics may still prattle on, but she doesn't hear them. Instead, she continues to reach for the high notes. The Performer's Paradox Criticism can arrive as potshots from the rude person in the front row or as toxic office gossip that can tear apart a team. Then there are times when a supervisor, peer, or loved one wants to give helpful feedback but doesn't know how to do that effectively. Anytime I hear, can I give you some constructive criticism? I know some unsolicited and often unhelpful or nitpicky advice is about to be levied. Criticism is criticism even when dressed up as being constructive. 
Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines a critic as one who expresses a reasoned opinion on any matter, especially involving a judgment of its value, truth, righteousness, beauty, or technique. That's a fair and perfectly appropriate way of behaving. But the dictionary also offers an alternative definition, one given to harsh or captious judgment. That's the kind of criticism I'm referring to. We often let criticism from people we don't know well or don't know at all affect us too much. Criticism in the realm of public speaking or any other creative endeavor taps into our more personal feelings because performing is an experience where we are undressed psychologically in public. It's a place where you're making yourself vulnerable in ways you haven't before. A friend put himself forward for a seat on our local school board. To be selected for this volunteer position, he had to appear at a town council meeting that many parents and other stakeholders attended, and everyone was allowed to make comments for or against candidates. Anyone could say anything they liked about him. To get on the board and to be of service, he was not only offering to donate his time, but he had to be willing to be criticized, even by people who aren't willing to donate their time. He was willing because he cared more about results than approval. Performing, whether on stage, in the field, in the office, or in a civic group where you seek a leadership position, places you under expanded scrutiny. You're stepping up and you're asking for the exposure that will result in people talking about you, sometimes negatively. The fact that your ambition to become a performer adds to your anxiety and fear and as a result increases your resistance to achieving your goal all adds to the performer's paradox. As you become a performer, you will need to deal with these conflicting intentions. Your super objective of becoming a community leader, advocate for a cause, or senior executive in a public company will battle with that familiar inner voice telling you to avoid situations where you could be criticized, laughed at, or rejected. I coach and advise many aspiring speakers, CEOs, authors, and others, and they find it helpful to realize that they ultimately have to choose between results or approval. In the end, the ones who choose results are more successful and more satisfied by their work. Which is more important to you, results or approval? Be honest. When I was younger, it was all about approval. Now, it's results. I won't sacrifice my values and certainly would not ever consider hurting anyone to achieve my goals, but I don't work for applause or status. I care about helping you shine in all the spotlight moments in your life. I care about delivering on the promise of this book. If you steal the show, then I've achieved my goal. Dealing with your conflicting intentions can also be a personal issue. In fact, many of our business problems are personal problems in disguise. That is, if you're not getting promoted at work, it might not have anything to do with your skills, but everything to do with how you interact with others. You have the intention to get ahead, but you might also have the intention of showing others that you're better than them in the process. Those are conflicting intentions, and they are getting in the way of your professional or personal development. If you are an artist, but you can't support yourself because you won't show your work because you feel it's selling out to cater to the commercial aspects of the art world, those conflicting intentions are getting in the way of your dreams of producing art that will reach the people you're meant to serve. If you want to give speeches on a topic you're passionate about because you want to change the world in some way, but you don't want to be criticized, those conflicting intentions will surely get in the way of you taking center stage. If you want to fall in love, but you also want to ensure you don't get hurt, those conflicting intentions may make it hard for you to be open to new possibilities. Or, if you are overly concerned with the approval of strangers rather than trusting yourself and the opinions of your loved ones who really know you, you are giving strangers too much power over your life and you need to stop. If you have one intention to go out there and nail it, to steal the show, and another intention not to put yourself in situations where you can be criticized, the latter will likely cancel out the former. Now that you understand what's at stake, let's liberate ourselves from these conflicting intentions. Two simple steps to silencing the critics. Step 1. Stop being critical. The first thing to do to silence the critics is to stop being critical. Most of us don't want to criticize others because we know how awful it is to receive negative feedback. And most of us have, to some degree, a fear of criticism. Yet many of us fall into the trap of criticizing others. 
Ironically, how we talk about others is also how we talk to ourselves. If you get in the habit of taking shots at competitors, venting about the boss, or gossiping, you may just derail your own agenda. Why? It's not a healthy mindset for doing your own creative work. Most off-the-cuff criticism misses the essence of performing and public speaking anyway. Performance, or any creative endeavor, including but not limited to writing, product development, design, or project management, ultimately succeeds through an evolving process of rehearsing, iterating, and getting better through both inevitable. Mistakes and moments of good and bad luck. It's easy to pick out a mistake in an otherwise solid performance. Each time you pick away at someone else's work without realizing it, you are increasing the likelihood that you will do the same to yours. I don't think you can be a critic and a performer. I'm talking about the kind of criticism that puts people down rather than building them up. Anyone can tear something down. It's much harder and more meaningful to build something better instead. So, you choose, are you going to focus on performing at your best or spend your time attempting to best other people? By being respectful, you allow other people to make their own decisions about creative work. When we judge others, we diminish ourselves. We end up playing smaller rather than bigger. Just think about it. Could a chef feel liberated doing his work while also writing restaurant reviews? Could an artist feel fully self-expressed painting in the morning and then start blogging negatively about other artists in the afternoon? I suppose they might, but it suggests a serious lack of empathy. The more you criticize others, the more attention you give those critical thoughts, and the more sensitive you will become to criticism yourself. That's how the mind works. The energy it takes to compare and tear down someone else's work is lost for more productive endeavors, such as getting ready for the big speech, pitch, or interview. And, when you prepare for your performances, you don't focus on good or bad, but rather on what works and what can be improved. Step 2. Give a presentation that doesn't have any holes to poke. Almost everyone filling a seat, sitting in a conference room or across the table from you, is there to get something from your performance, ideas, inspiration, or an interesting analysis. Note that I said almost. Within that audience are three camps. Some people already support you or agree with you because you share a similar view of the world. They will continue to buy in more and more as you present. Some people absolutely will never take your perspective or have personal reasons for not liking what you have to say. You don't have much of a chance with this group. Finally, you will have folks in the middle who are open to your ideas but aren't on your side of the table yet. They may want to accept and adopt your speech's message and objective but need help or a little push to get there. In preparing for the event, try not to focus solely on either your fans or the die-hard detractors. If you focus on the fans, you'll be heard as pandering, and if you focus only on the naysayers, you'll likely water down your message and alienate your fans as well as the large swath of folks between the two camps. Instead, focus on targeting those in the middle, who the political scientists call the persuadables. They are the ones who are willing to think differently, change their minds, and potentially adopt your worldview. Even though the persuadables are open to your ideas, you may be provoking them by asking them to change their worldview. It can be easier for an audience member, even a persuadable one, to poke holes in your work in order to escape from grappling with your ideas or opinions. That's the threshold you'll have to pass. Even the most wonderfully gracious people in your audience may try to resist your ideas or requests in order to protect their perspectives. Often, it's easier to find fault than to change a long-held belief. So it is incumbent on you to design your presentation in such a way that there aren't any holes to poke in it. In part three of this book, you will write, design, and develop speeches and presentations that are incredibly well organized and make a sound case for your ideas. In the meantime, let's start with a simple technique that you can use immediately to prevent others from poking holes in your point of view. Best of all, you can apply this technique to all of life's conversations and collaborations. When I give my book yourself solid keynote presentation in front of a marketing crowd, early on I share my perspective on marketing, that it rarely gets them clients, but it does raise awareness of what they sell. What they do once a potential buyer becomes aware of their product or service is what actually books the business. 
However, I always leave room for their perspective. For example, if I use absolutes in my language, if I say marketing never gets you clients, then I've created holes that are easy to poke. Or, if I use other absolutes like everybody, everything, always, or no one, it's pretty easy for someone to poke a hole in my position. For example, if I say, no one likes earwax flavored ice cream, you could refute my theory because it's possible that someone does, as crazy as it sounds, like earwax flavored ice cream. As you read this book, notice how I always attempt to leave room for alternative ideas or experiences by qualifying my statements with, it seems like, or it is often the case, or it appears to me, see what I just did. I said, I attempt to leave, because it's possible that I may inadvertently use an absolute that isn't actually an absolute somewhere in this book and miss it when editing. It's unlikely you can close every hole, but do everything within your power to make your arguments solid. If you do, it's less likely you or your work will be criticized. Plus, all generalities are false. Including that one. Thank you, but no. It's sophisticated to reflect on and analyze what's working and what can be improved in all aspects of your life. It's the key to successful personal and professional development. Additionally, it's helpful when someone offers you reflective, thoughtful analysis and tailors the discussion in great detail to what you want to achieve rather than their own agenda. It's mature and usually the most productive for them to ask consent to share their opinions and ideas with you. It's smart when they pick the right time to offer feedback, five minutes after your presentation is not that time. However, unless you are professionally or personally obligated to take someone's feedback, you have every right in the world to say thanks, but no thanks when it's offered. Too often we let other people inside our heads to be polite or out of some self-imposed sense of responsibility to hear people out. I don't think you have to. Of course, I don't suggest closing yourself off from feedback. Just make sure you allow when only the thoughts of conscientious and caring people. When you feel anxious about an aspect of a performance, always focus on the right thing, achieving your objective. Your job is simply to deliver on the promise built into the content of the speech you've created and rehearsed, the product launch you've shepherded through channels, or the annual strategic planning session you've designed and will facilitate. Always focus on the outcome you want to achieve in a meeting, interview, or negotiation rather than how you think you're doing and what you think people will think of you. Rise above the noise. Returning to the advice of our friend Bruno Mars, while you and I might not be movie or music stars and may only give a game-changing performance a few times a year, our job as performers is to uplift the people, to rise above the noise, and to give. Our audience a powerful experience that will change their thinking about their work, ignite their passions to make a difference, believe in something new about themselves, or say yes to your request for a salary bump, yes to buying your product or yes to investing in your company don't give critics the chance to slow you down and don't let the critic inside you do that either have a clear objective you should always have an objective often in a good script an objective is written into the scene to end the affair to propose to move out your action can change from scene to scene, but you should always work out what you are meant to be doing, D. Cannon, acting teacher. This first principle is about choosing. Where you want to go, what you want to do, and what you want to accomplish with your performance. In acting terms, we refer to our most important goal for a performance as the super objective and the smaller goals that get us to the big goal as our sub-objectives. In order to reach this big goal, you'll need to try every tactic you can think of until you succeed. You'll need boundless amounts of motivation to drive you forward toward success because obstacles are sure to stand in your way. That motivation is made up of your underlying needs and wants. I need food. I want money. I need security. If one tactic doesn't get you what you want, you try another, and if that doesn't work, you will try another, and so on. Think of it like working on a project. The project is designed around a big goal or a deliverable, the super objective. Then, you identify the milestones, sub-objectives, that you need to accomplish in order to achieve the big goal. Once you have milestones, you figure out which tasks, tactics, you need to pursue in order to reach them. 
If you have a deep need to achieve the big goal, you'll try any task you can think of to get it done. In any given performing situation, by defining your goal, you are able to uncover your true motivation. If you're making a speech, going for a promotion, trying to secure a loan, or interviewing for the job of your dreams, your motivation has to be so strong that you will not leave the room until your super objective is achieved. For example, classical music conductor Benjamin Zander said in his TED Talk, The Transformative Power of Classical Music, I'm not going to go on until every single person in this room, downstairs, and in Aspen, and everybody else looking, will. Come to love and understand classical music. So that's what we're going to do. Let's say you're going to give a speech to highlight the work of a charity you've become involved with and sit on the board of. You're passionate about the charity's work and have waited for years to get a leadership position. Your why you do it could be that, by the end of your speech, every person who hears you will make a contribution, including that Wall Street financier you imagined at the back of the room who will see you afterward and hand you a check made out to the charity for $250,000. Your deep need to achieve this goal is driven by your motivation to save lives, and that informs your choices, the tactics you will use, for the character you will play that night. This is a technique. Please don't take the example literally, don't filibuster the room until the audience falls asleep, chases you off the podium, or you make everyone donate even if they don't want to. From speech making to networking, motivation is a powerful and liberating tool available to guide you in the decisions you make. This might sound easy, but in practice many of us lose sight of our motivation to achieve a particular goal because of fear, distraction, or disillusion. During my acting training, I was taught to ask myself during early stage character development and rehearsals, what are my goals and what is my motivation to accomplish those goals? And so should you, no matter what you do. Where many go astray isn't so much in their lack of motivation. After all, we are all motivated in some way in every circumstance. The fault lies when our objectives and or motivations are unclear, conflicting, or muddy because we haven't approached the question with a true, clear purpose. Think about job interviews or presentations that fell short of your goals. Were you razor sharp about your objective and was your motivation mission critical, or were you focusing on what you think someone else wanted to see? Another example of the importance of having strong motivation can be seen in something that happened at a wedding. It was a tale of two toasts. The first one didn't have a clear goal or much discernible motivation to achieve a goal. The second had both. We were sitting at our tables, settling into our dinner. The father of the groom gave a flat, vague, and unfocused toast. His speech was written on a few loose pages that I had seen him editing right before the reception. He said some nice things about the couple, he wished them well, related a few memories about his son, thanked people for coming, and then free associated a little about going out on your own. He lost his place a couple times in his speech and wasn't able to express the joy he really felt inside. His objective may have been to simply give a good toast, but that's a losing proposition. You can't do a good job without a clear objective and compelling motivation about the other players in your scene, what you want for them or from them, and then acting out as many tactics as needed to achieve that goal. The father's motivation could have been to make his daughter-in-law feel that she was now not just his son's girlfriend, but an essential member of the family. To successfully do this, he needed some kind of motivation that would drive him and guarantee he'd achieve this goal. Why was this goal so important? What's the backstory? Was his son widowed and the family adored and can't stop talking about his first wife? Is the new wife often made to feel like she's an outsider by other members of the family? How important is it for the father to make his son's new wife feel like family? He may have had this intention, but it didn't come through in his performance, and this is key, because he didn't think through what he wanted to achieve in the moment and how he was going to get there. So his speech fell flat. He also didn't rehearse. Objectives and motivation are keys you uncover during the rehearsal process. On the other hand, at the same wedding, the bridesmaids had written and rehearsed a joint toast that stole the show. I knew they had a clear objective and strong motivation that got them started with their big idea. 
They wanted to give the guests a true understanding of what it's like to know the bride and groom the way they knew them, as great friends, as a real couple, as people, not two figures on top of a wedding cake. They created a clever stage bit about a dictionary that included definitions of all the terms that describe the couple. They performed it like an old-school comedy routine, with one bridesmaid throwing out the term and then another delivering the laugh line. They even created a mock dictionary that they used as a prop and gave to the couple as a gift. This was certainly the kind of toast that could have gone badly, but they had rehearsed so much that they owned their material. They were funny, bawdy, and loving. They stole the show. Their idea came out of their objective to share the real people they knew the bride and groom to be, and it worked. How do we go about finding our motivation? In the same way the actor needs to think through the writer's motivation for creating the characters, you need to know the goals your boss or event sponsor or negotiating partner has for the job at hand. If you are doing something on your own, know what you're trying to achieve and why. The actor will plan and study how her character will take action and respond minute by minute through the play. She will think about how the character responds to success, adversity, or bad news. In your process, you want to think about how your choices move you toward your objective or not. You want to think about how you respond to specific criticisms, how you overcome specific objections you expect to encounter, and how you will respond to any anxiety-provoking challenges. When making choices, always start with why and continue to ask yourself why until you get to the root of your need or desire. If you do, you'll unleash a motivation so compelling that you'll do everything in your power to pursue it. And that's what will make you interesting to watch. When you give a speech, if your motivation is clear and you'll try every tactic you can possibly think of to achieve your goal, do everything in your power to get the audience to think, feel, and do what you want them to do, then you'll be inspiring. To watch, gratifying to hire, exciting to date, thrilling to love, and just too darn fun. Using questions to establish motivation. Discovering motivation starts with asking the necessary questions. Many acting coaches teach a variation of legendary Russian actor and director Konstantin Stanislavsky's questions for character development. I've adapted them to serve your needs so you can use them to prepare for any pitch meeting, job interview, speech, or even first date. What do I want? If you're giving a speech and you don't have a strong objective, what's the point of being there? You're not there just to have a pleasant conversation. What is so important to accomplish that you must take the stage, so to speak, in order to accomplish it? Why do I want it? You must always have a strong reason for pursuing your objective. And when I say strong, I mean it is something you must accomplish at all costs, a save-the-world kind of motivation. What will happen if I don't get it now? The stakes should always be high. Otherwise, so what? The consequences of failing to achieve your objective need to be too terrible to do anything but achieve your objective. Ambivalence is never interesting, cool, or compelling. What happens if I do get it now? For you, the rewards must be so compelling that you're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve your objective. For the audience, the rewards must be so compelling that they're willing to change the way they see the world, to say yes to you, to think what you want them to think or do what you want them to do. What can I do to get what I want? This question leads you into the crucial distinction between knowing how to play the line and how to say the line. We'll explore this further later in the book, but keep in mind the infinite ways there are to say and present the same words depending on your goals and circumstances. You need to work out how you are trying to affect the other person with what you are saying. And so it is with speech making, deal making, and dating. What must I overcome? You must have an inner and outer obstacle. The outer obstacle gives the resistance, usually another person, company, industry, or social pressure, to attaining your goal. The inner obstacle is your own mental conflict. In speech making, the resistance in the audience creates conflict. We can't impose our perspective in a speech. Asking people to change the way they see the world can feel confrontational to them. It's a lot to ask in a short period of time. You need to overcome that resistance to reach your objective. The same is true in sales. 
The buyer often pushes back, offering great resistance. His objections are the obstacles you need to overcome. The same is often true during a job interview. The interviewer may have objections to hiring you that you need to overcome. Save energy and sharpen focus. Another benefit of knowing why you do it, you simplify your actions and make fewer wrong turns. You can map out how your performance carries out your motivation to achieve your objective. Having specific objectives and clear motivation means you know what you should not do, so you don't waste mental or physical energy. When we're doing too much at the office, in relationships, or on stage, it comes in part from not knowing what we want and where we're going. One of my business partners, Matthew Kimberly, often says that feeling overwhelmed is not necessarily a function of having too much to do, but rather not knowing what to do next. By identifying one super objective for a performance or a critical situation and mapping your plan to reach that super objective, you are freed from much of the fear or anger or other emotional baggage that can be churned up in these situations. The above questions will help you prepare for the spotlight. You'll know your objective and you'll be deeply connected to your motivation. You'll go after what you want with calm, focused, and steady abandon. And guess what? You'll achieve your goals. Act as if most of us have experienced it, that antsy feeling that we're out of place or insecure in certain social, public, or personal situations where we're the center of attention. We can't find that mental release from our discomfort, even when we are in the midst of an opportunity that interests us, whether a date or a speaking opportunity or a job interview. We hear the inner voice saying, this is not you, or maybe a voice of authority from our distant past saying, you really don't belong here. That sense of not fitting in or being ready for the spotlight is a reality the vast majority of us face at one point or another, but there is a way to control this feeling. We turn to our second principle, which actors call acting as if. What is acting as if? Acting as if is an imagination technique for converting what we see as adverse circumstances in work or life into new and more aspirational opportunities. When you are acting as if, you are using your brain's amazing powers to positively anticipate and create a different way of seeing the world and or a different way of behaving. It's a technique that helps overcome negative behaviors and attitudes that hold you back so you can begin to make more conscious and intentional choices about how you want to perform and what you want to achieve when it matters. In the words of Mark Twain, you cannot depend on your eyes if your imagination is out of focus. Here's another way to think about it. The word drama, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, derives from a Greek word meaning to do or to act. Therefore, acting as if gets you ready to take the initiative. It starts you thinking about your intention and the possibilities ahead. Most actors agree that acting as if learned early in their training is a magical elixir for inhabiting the challenge of developing a character. It helps them focus on what that character wants to achieve. Then they start thinking as if they were that person, as if they lived in that time, as if they were in the character's situation. Most actors use this principle to begin the process of filling in a multilayered understanding of a character, often drawing on nothing more than their life experience, some research, and, most profoundly, their imagination. You can certainly adapt this approach to help find and secure the manner in which you want to be perceived as a speaker at a public event. Even better, by adapting this technique, you'll find that you can catapult yourself into a higher level performance. Why and how to act as if? But how does one get into the mindset to act as if? How do you master this technique? One key is in understanding disclosive spaces. This may sound academic, but there are great insights to be gleaned from this concept. A disclosive space is the way each of us sees the world and operates in it, our personal perspective, but more than that. It is our way of understanding how different complexities are interrelated, how they fit together, and how we fit into them. Children can rarely understand things outside their own disclosive space, but as our brains mature, we develop the potential to see and understand in depth things that are outside our own experience if we simply pay attention. 
A non-performer might look at the spaces outside him or herself as separate and apart, while the performer sees these disclosive spaces as opportunities he or she can step into, inhabit, live, and portray. Imagine you and a colleague have a conflict over a work-related issue. You think he went behind your back and spoke badly about you. You confront him about it and he says that he's the one who's been betrayed because you didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. But if you can't say, I'm going to look at this as if I were him, then how can you resolve the conflict? As adults, we allow our disclosive spaces to narrow as we become so busy or caught up in our daily activities that we neglect other points of reference and unique perspectives. Our sense of disclosive space is also affected by factors such as mood and mindset. I'm sure you've noticed how being in a good mood makes it easier to notice the people around you and take an interest in them while being in a bad mood does the opposite. The as-if technique can help you use your imagination and life experiences to inhabit disclosive spaces as part of your journey to achieve your goals. It's a way of being mindful of other people and circumstances and incorporating that knowledge into how you live and work. Events such as speeches, team meetings, or networking get-togethers team with new disclosive spaces to inhabit. Acting as if on the job. I think about my acting friends who had jobs in retail during their early years of training and starting out in theater. One of them was a greeter at Bloomingdale's who had to stake out high-traffic parts of the store and steer shoppers to the various departments. Even if she had a long night in rehearsal or just wasn't in the mood, if she was going to keep her day job, she had to be absolutely convincing that she was delighted to be there and in service to the people coming through the door. If that's not acting as if, I don't know what is. Acting as if got her ready to shine every time. She imagined the shoppers as if they were classmates of hers from college at a reunion on one day, as if they were her favorite group of cousins another day, as if she was a part owner of the store the next day. Whatever as if helped her tap an outgoing generosity and keep her mind engaged and playful so she could perform at a higher level. I'm not suggesting you have to be someone else to act as if. Sure, there have always been a few great method actors who behaved as if they were actually the character off stage or between takes. I love the story about the filming of the epic thriller Marathon Man when the great method actor Dustin Hoffman found himself exhausted after staying up a number of nights in a row just as the character in the script does. His counterpart in the film, Sir Lawrence Olivier, was considered the greatest living actor in the world at that time, and he did not go to those extremes. One day, legend has it, Olivier turned to Hoffman, who was nodding off on the set, and said, Why don't you just try acting, my boy? I like to think that Olivier wasn't putting him down. Rather, he was trying to relieve Dustin's stress by showing him another perspective, another way of being. The power of imagination. I started this chapter talking about imagination. Learning to act as if is not about visualizing idle fantasies about wealth and power. Acting as if is about using the brain's amazing powers of imagination to learn, change, and experience new things. The majority of mental health professionals and neuroscientists say this is healthy because you're refocusing the brain on productive prosocial and contributory behaviors. It can also be transformational. There's a bookshelf of research on the effectiveness of imagination and cognition to improve one's athletic performance, overall health and well-being, and even aging. Research on visualization shows that imagining the execution of a task successfully contributes to more positive outcomes. Brain scans support this by showing that visualization triggers a shift from the left to the right brain hemisphere. This transfer from the left, logical, hemisphere to the right, creative imagination, hemisphere enhances visual imagery and actually creates new neural patterns in the brain. When an athlete visualizes success, their body really is experiencing success, observes Dr. Bernie Siegel, the author of Love, Medicine, and Miracles and retired professor of surgery at Yale Medical School. When you imagine something, your body really feels like it's happening. Acting as if it's just that, strategic imagination aiming you in the right direction for successful personal and business performance. How we can use acting as if. Acting as if is also a strategy for dealing with anxiety and worry. 
It helps us stay balanced and organizes our energy. It's one of the ways you'll reduce stage fright, which can occur anytime you're in the spotlight, be it when you are leading a meeting, giving a speech, being interviewed, or even docking a boat. I have a decent-sized boat, and even though I'm a United States Coast Guard licensed captain, it can be pretty tricky to dock a boat when weather conditions aren't favorable, so I visualize the entire process before I start. This works like a charm. I imagine that I'm going to dock the boat in this slip as if I've done it 10,000 times. Most good old salty captains with whom I've talked about this tell me they do the same thing, even though they, in fact, really have already docked the boat 10,000 times. By acting as if you begin to shift your consciousness from self-defeating ways of thinking into new conscious directions. It may seem simple in its approach, but the power of positive visualization lets your brain rehearse what lies ahead so that when your big performance arrives, it will seem as if you have already done that speech thousands of times before. This is what rehearsal is for. The acting as if technique is one to keep handy for emergencies as well. It can be surprisingly helpful in difficult but ultimately manageable times when you may not be at your best, coping with a personal issue or even just dealing with a lingering cold. But using an as-if approach will work when you know the show must go on. You know how body language affects how others see you, but it may also change how you see yourself. Harvard University social psychologist Amy Cuddy has done extensive research on how power posing, standing in a posture of confidence even when you don't feel confident, can raise testosterone levels while reducing cortisol levels in your brain. In fact, Cuddy's research paper, Power Posing, Brief Nonverbal Displays Affect Neuroendocrine Levels and Risk Tolerance, published in 2010 by the Association for Psychological Science, showed that various power poses increased testosterone levels by 20% and decreased cortisol levels by 25%. That's a pretty dramatic representation of the power of acting as if. In fact, Cuddy's motto is, fake it until you make it, which you now see actually has biological implications. Of course, the best part is that you can do it authentically. As with any sustained commitment to learning new ideas, the more you invest in acting as if in the other performance techniques, the more these ways of being will translate to gains in your public interactions. The mind, once stretched by a new idea, Ralph Waldo Emerson once observed, never returns to its original dimensions. The act as if technique gives you the opportunity to become the thing you're imagining yourself to be. You act as if you're in charge. You act as if you are calm. You act as if you look forward to speaking to large groups. And slowly, those things become more and more true. And your performances become more and more natural. Your imagination is a powerful asset. If it can make you think small, it can also ensure you think big. If it can make you feel small, it can ensure that you feel big. Eventually, acting as if becomes acting as is. Raise the stakes. Learning how T.O. take the risks required of winning performances and to manage any anxieties or fears you have in the process calls for becoming comfortable with discomfort. This means you first figure out what kind of risks to take and how they will benefit you. Then you start getting comfortable with the discomfort that risk-taking brings. Sometimes that means breaking the rules. No, I don't mean you should break rules that will get you fired or incarcerated. Rather, adopt the principle that to create memorable presentations and performances, sometimes you must find ways to surprise, delight, provoke, and push the boundaries of your audience to build and create new things. Let's say you're responsible for a presentation about your unit at an annual meeting, and in the past you've used PowerPoint and have done a competent, vanilla sugar cookie kind of job, to the point, brief, factual, and professional. But others at your level do the same thing, and even you know it's boring. Your teenage kid suggests you try to produce a video like dollarshalfclub.com, something funny, quirky, and memorable. While you may be unfamiliar with video and nervous about surprising your boss, you decide to take the extra time to hire a young producer to create a two-minute documentary about your team's greatest accomplishments as the characters from the TV. Program the office. 
Since you're not going to play it safe and produce a typical industrial corporate video, you don't want your boss to say no or start micromanaging the video, so you get it completed under the radar. You know the results you're looking for, your team's work will be more talked about and remembered than in years past. You will also demonstrate that you can use technology and, more importantly, creativity to improve the audience experience. Even if your boss or peers find fault with the video, unless it is stupidly offensive, they won't be able to do more than quibble and will most likely be blown away by your commitment to making it happen. But that's the risk you take. Outstanding performers learn to take smart chances even when they're scared. How taking risks pays off. Now, please don't lose your perspective on this. Don't take risks for the heck of it or for a short-term gain such as showing up a competitor or getting flash-in-the-pan publicity. Risk levels and results must correlate. Let's say you're a small business owner negotiating for the first time with a large company that is offering a substantial contract, but their deal terms are particularly unfavorable for you. In many situations like this, the small business may take the contract as offered to bag the elephant and get the hefty contract even if the deal terms don't sustain profitability. With your new mindset of a performer, you can raise the stakes by simply sitting without speaking or moving after you make your counteroffer, which can be really uncomfortable. If they reject it, you can simply get up, thank them for their time, and leave the room. It's simple. It's dramatic. And it's risky. You've got to be willing to walk away. But they may call you back in and tell you they had time to think about it and are happy to accept your offer. Or you may not get the contract. But there are also considerable benefits to establishing a precedent for future business, ensuring your big contract can be performed profitably, and perhaps, best of all, by building your confidence. This is a performance, remember, you're stepping out of your role as the quiet, compliant small vendor to act as if you are on the same professional plane, as if you have the confidence to negotiate for what's fair and what a qualified vendor should. Have in this situation. Win or lose, you know you've stayed true to your values and didn't sell out. But, most times, the outcome will be a better contract and a better prospect for success for the risk taker, that's you. Discomfort often signals opportunity. Discomfort often signals opportunity. Before I started my own business, as I mentioned earlier, I was an executive at a publicly traded sports club company. When I came on board, the company's financial systems for payroll and reporting were a disaster, particularly for assessing the value of fitness instructors and, most pressingly, for getting these same instructors their paychecks. I knew if I didn't make immediate changes, I wouldn't be able to keep top performers and evaluate payroll per instructors versus club revenues and profits. Surprisingly, after meeting with my boss, I found out the leadership didn't want to make any investments or major overhauls. The choice was clear, keep my head down and make very little impact and start looking for a new job or raise the stakes so I could make life easier for myself and the employees and produce better results for the company to boot. The first option would be comfortable and easy. The second option would require living with the knowledge that my job could blow up quickly. I shared my concern with my girlfriend at the time, and she told me she knew a fellow in her tech department who was a whiz at financial modeling and who created software on a freelance basis. So I traded him two executive club memberships for a piece of financial software that he developed per my specifications. I showed it to the leadership team, and even though they weren't thrilled that I flew under the radar to get it done, they loved it and rolled it out company-wide. If they hadn't loved it, I might have looked bad and suffered a setback. That was the risk. But I also knew the goal was worth it. Three months later, I received a promotion. Coincidental? Absolutely not. Remember, you're not taking risks just to take risks. There's a reason why you're performing, to produce better results professionally and personally. And when you dare to get bigger results, this can be the most exhilarating and personally satisfying aspect of being a performer. By raising the stakes, you adjust to being comfortable with discomfort. 
As you rehearse for your conference speech, wedding toast, sales pitch, or plan how you will negotiate your deal, you experience discomfort and allow yourself to feel uncomfortable so you can find out what happens when you work through the idea. I remember this experience well from the writing and rehearsal process for my show, The Think Big Revolution. See what I just did there? I referred to The Think Big Revolution as a show. I perform it as a 55-minute keynote at conferences across industries and to different demographics. But I don't think of it as a speech or a talk. Instead, I think of it as a show. Doing so allows me to think like a performer rather than a speaker. It encourages me to show rather than tell. It compels me to take more risks and make bigger choices for the audience. There's a scene in the Think Big Revolution show when I talk about raising the stakes and being comfortable with discomfort. I tried on the idea of wearing a pair of red 6-inch high heels during the scene to demonstrate being comfortable with discomfort because it made me both physically and emotionally uncomfortable. I knew the audience would never forget the point. Would the choice work or would I look like an idiot? I didn't know. But, instead of saying no to the idea, I took the time to rehearse it to see if it would work. If it did, I'd keep it in the show, even if it made me uncomfortable. After all, the job of the performer is to serve the audience, no matter how uncomfortable he or she is during the process. After kicking the idea around for a few weeks of rehearsal, I took it out of the show because I found a better way to illustrate the concept. However, I would never have ultimately found a better way of doing the scene and nailing my point had I played it safe from the beginning. Raising the stakes for better performances. Pushing the comfort zone is what great performers do well, because time and again they discover that by playing all out in rehearsal they find the smaller or more refined choice that brings the character to a new level. In Marlon Brando's famous audition for The Godfather, he took the chance of stuffing his cheeks with cotton because he wanted Don Corleone to look like a bulldog. It worked so well that not only did Brando get the part, but Francis Ford Coppola recreated the look for the character with a plastic prosthesis. Another way of raising the stakes is making a promise to your audience. The promise has to relate to something that matters to you and is reflected in your subject matter. And the promise is something you've worked through in your rehearsal process and are confident you can deliver. When President Kennedy said in an address to Congress, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth, he was making a promise and raising the stakes for his administration. If you're making an annual presentation about your department's objectives for the year and you start the speech with a declaration that by the same time next year you will increase net profit from 9 to 15 percent, you will have the attention of everyone in the room. Yes, 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 you absolutely have to have a smart strategic plan to actually make this kind of promise. Let's be real, it's a scary world when you're performing instead of watching. If there weren't risks in performing in high-stakes situations, the rewards would be far fewer. It may feel like you are balancing on a high wire with people torn between wanting to see you fall and wanting to see you cross safely to the other side. But that's all in your mind. Most people, especially an audience, don't want you to fall. They want you to take risks so that it feels to them like you're balancing on a high wire, but all the while, they're rooting for you to make it to the other side successfully. If you can do it with some flair and a bit of panache, they'll stand up and cheer for a job well done. When you complete the high wire, high risk act with grace, you've won the room and the crowd. Say yes and... We all know that famous saying, the show must go on. Well, here's the rub about that old chestnut. The show never goes on when you say no in any area of life. Whatever the personal relationships among the cast members, when they are rehearsing and performing, actors and performers, creative artists, inventors, and visionaries thrive on the power of saying yes. Saying yes and not only improves the writing and rehearsal process, but it makes meetings more effective, helps persuade your spouse or partner during a difficult conversation, and gives you a new confidence for networking and winning the room. 
In her book Bossy Pants and in many interviews, Tina Fey of Saturday Night Live and 30 Rock fame has explained the importance of saying yes in her work and then figuring out how to do what she agreed to later. Whatever the problem, be part of the solution, she writes. Don't just sit around raising questions and pointing out obstacles. Know the distinction between saying yes and giving lip service. Saying yes is about having the mindfulness to recognize and to respond positively to the content and feeling of another person's thoughts in conversation in real time. Saying yes and is about a leap of faith where you give your attention to what others are offering, trusting that you'll know what to do next. The danger of saying no, shutting down creativity. Let's say you and I are doing an improv scene for an audience and you come on stage limping, clearly in a lot of pain, shouting, I've broken my leg, and I respond by saying, no, you haven't. Suddenly, the forward momentum stops. I've shut you down and the scene might not carry on. However, if I responded by saying, oh, my goodness, that's terrible. But, your hair looks fabulous. Did you do something different with it? Now we're onto something because I've framed my reaction by saying yes, and... You would be able to respond in many different ways, one of which would be, really, do you think so? I was at the hair salon and the stylist used so many chemicals that I passed out, fell out of the chair, and that's how I broke my leg. This principle doesn't apply solely to improv as a strategic tactic, saying yes, and helps us to look at creativity, collaboration, and problem solving as a way to maintain momentum regardless of the negativity or problems that come our way. The danger of saying in O, discouraging audience engagement, how does this tactic apply to performance or public speaking? One best-selling author had finished his speech and was taking questions. An audience member asked, how can I meet the most relevant people at this event? The speaker didn't like the question because, rightly so, he thinks everybody is relevant. However, he then humiliated this poor guy by telling him so in front of thousands of people. The energy in the room deflated as the audience members suddenly realized that they too could be ridiculed. After that, only a few more people mustered the courage to ask a question, and I'm sure many left with an enduring negative impression of a bullying moment, rather than appreciating the good advice that was present inside the know that surrounded the answer to the question. A more helpful approach might have been to bridge from his question by reframing it, thanks so much for your question. Yes, it reminds me how everyone here is relevant, so I'd recommend spending as much time as you can networking because you never know how one relationship can open the door to another. The author could then pivot and offer advice on how to meet people. The simple reframe would have recognized the individual asking the question and also served the audience. The point is, there's always a way to turn a potentially negative situation into a positive form by using the yes and technique. Yes, it does take a little time and forethought to do this, but it can and should be done, especially if you're eager for a warm reception at the end of your talk. The danger of saying an O, oh, preventing creative dialogue, is there a person in your workplace meetings or teams who likes to take the role of devil's advocate, such an unappealing cliche when you think about its meaning? Let's call him the DA. You know how he works. As the meeting develops, a colleague puts forth a suggestion or initiative. Invariably, the DA plays his part. Just to be the devil's advocate, he begins, here's why that won't work, or Gary in accounting won't go for it. And so on. What's inevitable is that he shuts people down, slows down the positive flow, doesn't bridge to the workable aspects of the idea, but continues to poke holes in it. In fact, the DA loves to poke holes in things and even relishes the role. The DA justifies his advocacy with statements such as, we can't take off with a half-baked idea. The truth is, just as there are no fully baked cakes that don't pass through a half-baked stage, the same applies to ideas. The deeper truth is that your colleague is saying no far too many times. Monitor these kinds of conversations as I have and you will notice how quickly the overall productive and collaborative discussion will die off as the meeting leader moves on to the next routine topic. The DA has, in effect, killed off creativity and shut down dialogue. 
If by any chance you've played the DA or can influence someone who does, consider this if you want a more prominent role in meetings and want to become a shareholder of more successful ideas. When a peer at the table makes a suggestion and the DA interrupts and sees issues with it, redirect the energy of the room. Realize that being the party of no hurts the DA and the people around her. Shift the discussion by using the yes and tactic and you'll begin gaining allies and collaborators. Saying no happens often and you don't want it to happen to you. Talented people who say no to the spotlight tend to stay in the background behind the computer screen. The more they say no, the more comfortable they become with the status quo and the more they are upstaged, allowing people to steal the show from them. Saying yes and performing when the stakes are high. If you have 15 minutes to spare, listen to Michael Massimino's audio story produced by the nonprofit storytelling organization The Moth as broadcast on many public radio stations. Massimino is an MIT-trained astronaut who was assigned to take a spacewalk to fix one of the Hubble Space Telescope's most valuable and delicate technologies, a spectrograph that detects weather atmospheres on far-off planets and other solar systems. Could support life. Talk about pressure. Massimino, working with another astronaut who was inside the shuttle, examines the sensor, which was designed to be tamper-proof, in a rocket scientist kind of way. His fellow astronaut talks him through different solutions as one idea after another fails, but they never say no. Massimino observed, I was beginning to feel pretty alone, and I don't mean sitting in a chair by yourself on a Sunday afternoon wearing your slippers and reading the newspaper alone. The two astronauts have the fate of the Hubble Space Telescope in their hands, and they keep saying yes, and to one more idea and one more thought and one more approach until the sensor is fixed. Finally, Massimino enjoys a moment watching Earth hanging amidst all of the terrifyingly beautiful grandeur of space from outside the shuttle. How yes and works for you at work. Saying yes and is key to the way many of our greatest entrepreneurs think and work. Google Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt said in a much-admired speech to UC Berkeley's graduates in 2012, even if it is a bit edgy, a bit out of your comfort zone, saying yes means that you will do something new, meet someone new, and make a difference in your life, and likely in others' lives as well. Yes lets you stand out in a crowd, to be the optimist, to stay positive, to be the one everyone comes to for help, for advice, or just for fun. Yes is what keeps us all young. Yes is a tiny word that can do big things. Say it often. But Schmidt didn't just start talking about yes in his commencement addresses. Saying yes pervades Google's famous culture and operating processes, which are not quite the corporate fairy tale imagined on the street, but are nonetheless innovative and dramatically different from life at many competing tech giants. Many of Google's processes are about keeping up manager-employee dialogue, personal enterprise, and access to senior executives throughout the organization free of unnecessary notes. Among the many examples at Google are its TGIF meetings, where employees submit public questions to senior management, posting employee and team quarterly goals on its intranet, its flat and flexible organizational structure, where employees are allowed to change projects without going through approvals, and its practice of allowing its employees to use 20% of their time to develop and explore their own initiatives. Tim Ferriss, author of The 4-Hour Work Week, is another example of how the saying yes and mindset can power you past the conventional boundaries. Tim decided to keep saying yes and over and over again to his big idea that it's possible to be successful by working fewer hours, not more. He persevered, despite enduring early failures. Supposed experts and gatekeepers said no, but Tim and his literary agent, Stephen Hanselman, also my agent, kept saying yes, and until they finally got the green light from one publisher. Just one. And that's all they needed. I'm sure those who said no are still kicking themselves because, at the time of this writing, the four-hour work week is fast approaching sales of nearly two million copies. Neuroscience back saying yes, and saying yes, and is also confirmed by science as a tonic for your brain and productivity. 
I won't get too technical, but if you haven't heard about negativity bias, it's a pretty interesting concept. Experts in neuroscience write about this frequently. Because our brains evolved millions of years ago, when human beings could become a meal for a lion or saber-toothed tiger or be easily overrun by marauding tribes, survival required noticing the faintest signals of danger in our environment. Over the millennia since, we've become wired to scout for danger. As a result, our brains tend to have greater memories, stronger initial reactions, and more stickiness for the kinds of no's and pushbacks that are common in an office workplace and in business in general. The parts of our brain that fear serious mayhem are easily triggered by small stuff, such as the boss shooting down your idea in a meeting, dinging your tribal status in front of your peers. As neuroscientist and author Rick Hansen has written, we continually look for negative information, overreact to it, and then quickly store these reactions in brain structure. For example, we learn faster from pain than from pleasure, and negative interactions have more impact on a relationship than positive ones. In effect, our brain is like Velcro for the bad but Teflon for the good. Because our brains have this almost telepathic paranoia for criticism and threat, scientists and neuroleadership experts such as David Rock have written about the importance of avoiding the brain's threat radar and managing and motivating people, including yourself, to give their best performance. Performers know this intuitively. When people encounter a stimulus, Rock has written, their brain will either tag the stimulus as good and engage in the stimulus approach, or their brain will tag the stimulus as bad and disengage from the stimulus avoid. If a stimulus is associated with positive emotions or rewards, it will likely lead to an approach response. If it is associated with negative emotions or punishments, it will likely lead to an avoid response. Numerous studies show that the engagement we get from focusing on the approach response has positive effects on decision-making, stress management, collaboration, and motivation. Or as Rock says, people learn best when they are interested in something. Interest is an approach state. Saying yes and is an approach trigger, it begins the positive cycle of creative, productive problem solving. Saying yes and isn't about giving yourself permission to say or do whatever crosses your mind. But it is about giving yourself permission to explore and experiment, to improve your ideas by finding out what works and what doesn't. Writing and rehearsing for your spotlight moments can be messy, and you need to say yes and to your own talent so it can find its way. If you really want to take the first step to becoming an outstanding speaker and performer, then get accustomed to saying yes. Be in the moment. Listening is a dramatic technique you can use on a daily basis. But what actors mean by listening is probably different from what you're familiar with. Listening is about fully inhabiting the moment with other rehearsed and prepared cast members so that they respond to the scene with choices that are authentic, fresh, and consistent. When actors are not listening in this way, they are not responding to what is actually coming back at them and they will seem inauthentic, which leads to disjointed and disconnected performances. Listening is about bringing all your skills to the performance. Rehearsal prepares you for the performance. If you're prepared, during your performance you will be able to listen to what is actually happening around you. It helps you stay in the moment. What you do when you're on live is what people will remember, and listening is a powerful component of live performance. We like to think we listen to what others are saying, but I'm not sure we listen as well as we think we do. Have you had conversations where, mentally, you've already written your script and are running through it in your mind while the other person is talking? I know I have. Instead of being interested in actively responding to what you hear, you're looking for a place to jump in with your own script and score a point. But by honing my acting skills over the years, I've improved my ability to truly listen to what is being said. Not just to understand, but to feel what's being said. Listening is one of the most underappreciated tools in the performer's toolbox. Great actors don't manufacture emotion. They get angry, sad, or joyful in response to what they hear. Cicely Berry of the Royal Shakespeare Company, in her book Voice and the Actor, says, in his relationship with the other characters, the actor must give himself up wholly to listening so that what they say can affect him. 
It is only by being this open that the voice will respond freshly and that it will be surprising. It can then take the actor himself by surprise. There are four ways the most connected people actively listen. Thorough preparation, by being present, by paying attention with all their senses, by viewing themselves in the third person, using aesthetic awareness. Preparation for your own performance. When you prepare for a pitch, meeting, speech, or negotiation, the goal is to know your material so well that you are free to be in the moment. This is an important condition for listening because it's hard to allow yourself to improvise if you don't know your material right down to the core. Rehearsing gives you the confidence to respond to the events and reactions of the moment, knowing you can come back to where you want to go with your planned content. You'll be able to respond without disallowing anything outside of your predetermined script. When you're interviewing for a job, sitting down for a meeting with the executive team, or meeting someone for the first time, if you don't know your material well, it can be difficult to stay in the moment because much of your brain's bandwidth is. Being taken up trying to remember or figure out what to do next. However, if you know your material so well that you can purposely forget what you prepared, you can bring new riffs, changes, and higher energy levels to your performance. You know your material so well that you can stay in the moment and let it come to you organically. Or consider what happens when I meet editors in the publishing industry to talk about a book project. I can be extremely well prepared with my pitch, but if I'm not open and ready to respond to suggestions and comments I receive during the meeting, they may decide I'm not an author they want to work with because I'm not open to their ideas. So I always approach these meetings with my mind very alert and open to how the people in the room are responding to the book discussion. Since I'm well prepared, when the editorial team offers new ideas and suggestions, I'm comfortable going off script and confident that I can go back to my script, adjusting as necessary. But it all starts with being well prepared and rehearsed so I can stay in the moment and listen to what's being sent my way. Being prepared increases the odds of seizing big opportunities in the moment. Presence. Presence is the second facet of listening. In the midst of a performance, whether you are sharing or alone in the spotlight, presence is about using the power of silence and pauses to stay rooted in the moment as it occurs. When you're not speaking, you want to really concentrate and hear what's being said, as opposed to quickly jumping ahead to your next response. This habit requires its own level of persistent practice to tune into using your senses to slow down and absorb the verbal and nonverbal language of your counterparts. You will never have a particular moment again, so it's worth the investment to fully experience it in real time. Presence helps make you a whole brain listener with greater empathy and engagement. Improving presence improves individual communications. The auditory neuroscientist Seth Horowitz, author of The Universal Sense, How Hearing Shapes the Mind, wrote in the New York Times, listening is a skill that we're in danger of losing in a world of digital distraction and information overload. And yet we dare not lose it. Because listening tunes our brain to the patterns of our environment faster than any other sense, and paying attention to the non-visual parts of our world feeds into everything from our intellectual sharpness to our dance skills. Fortunately, you can train your listening, it's a skill like any other, if you focus on improvement, that is. Train yourself, when listening, to clear your mind of anything other than what is being said to you. Don't plan your response. Don't judge what you're hearing. Don't just listen to the words. Listen for the emotional undercurrent, listen to the confusion in the thought process, and to the pacing and tone and inflection, and you'll actually hear what's being said. This is why later in the book we'll also focus on managing the pace and speed of your speech. If you are speaking without pausing, it's likely that you're not listening to what the audience needs from moment to moment. If you are always talking, you aren't reacting. And our reactions are hugely powerful aspects of communication. Backstage columnist Craig Wallace, who has written frequently about presence, says, Real listening is the kind that requires you to clear your adult mind and focus exclusively on the person right there in front of you and what he or she has to say. The kind in which you allow the person's words and thoughts to penetrate your heart and mind and then let your reactions to those words emanate purely and powerfully from your eyes as your face relaxes from its neutral curtain and becomes alive with expression. 
Real listening is about listening as a form of communication that is just as dynamic as speaking and is appreciated as such. Presence isn't just a practice for actors, Zen monks, or yoga teachers. Think of professional athletes and the ability certain players have to get into the zone to inhabit the moment that allows their skills to be fully expressed with effortless flow unhampered by any distractions and stay in the zone no matter the distractions. When I'm giving a speech, I can actually watch myself doing it. An amateur may walk off stage and say, I have no idea what I just said. But a professional knows exactly what she did every step of the way. Not only is she performing, she is actually observing her performance in real time. This is a powerful experience. It's a high-level skill that you will develop over time. You don't need to be a professional to do so. Paying attention with all your senses. When you are present, you also begin paying attention with all your senses. Consider a deal meeting or job interview where you are entering that particular room or office, most likely for the first time. You want to notice, what is the size of the room? What does your counterpart's desk or table suggest to you? What is the layout of the workplace? What are the other people wearing? If you're being interviewed by an executive who looks exhausted, makes poor eye contact while slurping a massive cappuccino with a half-eaten sandwich on his desk, these are all real facts that you should notice as they will affect your performance. If you walk through a workplace and notice people moving briskly, exhibiting confidence and energy, grouping up informally for a casual meeting, this is valuable data as well. Listening isn't just something you do with your ears. When I am giving a speech, in addition to observing myself, I'm listening to the audience with my ears, eyes, and body. When I see people taking notes, I know they're resonating with a point I made and I know that I need to pause so they don't miss what I'll say next. If I sense a touch of fatigue or feel they're getting restless, I'll get them up on their feet and have them play a game. If there's a glaring technical glitch, I'll openly address it. If it's hot in the room, I'll try to fix it. Showing empathy for the audience means I'm paying attention to how they are listening and what they are feeling. It's the difference between awareness and a lack thereof. If you're not aware that your mic is too loud or if there's no mic and you're speaking too softly, you'll lose the room pretty quickly. Think of this heightened approach to listening as a long-distance kind of pitching and catching. Let's say you and I are having a long toss, so to speak, talking one-on-one, -on -one, but we're 50 yards away from each other. After I say my lines, as a listener, I will wait to see if you caught what I said, and that means not only seeing the ball hit your glove, but listening for the thwack sound. I will then pause to ensure that you have caught the ball before I continue. The same technique applies when speaking to a small group of people or even a large audience. In short, listen to your audience and give your words some time to sink in before going on to your next point. Aesthetic Awareness As you become a more accomplished performer, you will be ready to move on to a more advanced stage of listening that involves aesthetic awareness, a performer's sixth sense of how they are being perceived and how their audience is responding as they use the stage, deliver their presentation, and interact with the people and situations around them. You can do this in a job interview or negotiation or any of life's important performances. Experience and dedication result in a new ability. You will see yourself as the audience sees you. As I mentioned above, an experienced and well-rehearsed performer sees, feels, and hears everything that's going on in the room around her and can also see herself while she's performing. It's the ability to keenly observe yourself while you're in the moment. It may be a hard concept to grasp when you haven't experienced it, but if you focus on the techniques I'm giving you to stay in the moment, you'll eventually know it yourself. It's powerful. Choose early and often. You always have two choices, your commitment versus your fear, Sammy Davis Jr. Throughout this journey, use the courage of your convictions to make strong choices. It's the actor's secret weapon for surprising audiences and creating dramatic moments. And it's yours too. It's fine to make wrong choices based on good intentions, but if you fear making choices to the point that you fail to make them at all, it can be fatal to your performances. Why? 
For many people, self-doubt and procrastination are the twin enforcers of the behaviors that have already prevented them from taking the next step. I've found that one of the big obstacles people face in seizing opportunities for speeches and other public expressions of leadership is an unfounded fear of making the wrong choice. However, if you don't make big, sometimes risky choices, your performances will be as unique and exciting as Wonder Bread. Only by making strong choices will you experience success and progress and therefore reinforce your commitment to change yourself and the world through your work and performances. This principle is quite compelling to me because it is a common skill exhibited by the most successful people and it is within your reach. Making good strong choices isn't being smart or wonderful. It is our choices that show what we truly are far more than our abilities, author J. K. Rowling has written. Making choices is simply a skill to learn and a technique to apply. Above all, don't procrastinate. You'll never catch any fish if all you ever do is debate with yourself about which type of bait to use and never throw a line in the water. You won't likely discover your super objective, clarify your motivation, say yes, and take risks, learn to live in the moment, and act as if unless you make strong choices and put them into play. Yes, it takes courage to make strong choices. I know many people who are prone to procrastination, are aware of it, and work hard to overcome it. I also know many people who have been hurt by it, sales opportunities wasted, deadlines missed, loves lost, plans mislaid, and careers destroyed. Not adopting the commitment to choose early and often can hold you back at every step. For example, when I was an actor and my agent would call me with a scheduled audition time, I'd head to his office to pick up the script and find out which scenes the casting director had assigned me to prepare. I'd hoof it over to Starbucks, fight all the other actors for a free seat, hunker down, and read through the script. As I began work on the pages assigned for the audition material, I'd start to think about what the casting director, director, and producer might be looking for from the role. Anticipating what they wanted and aiming to deliver that rather than making my own choices about what I thought would be most compelling was my first big mistake. Unfortunately, I didn't realize this until years after I left acting. It was a thong myself on the head kind of moment. I had it all backwards. In reality, the casting director, director, and producer wanted me to come into the room and show them how the role should be played, how I thought it should be played. The casting director wants you to do a good job because he doesn't want to be fired. Casting directors are replaced faster than Elizabeth Taylor's husbands when the director isn't happy with the actors she's seen. How do they solve that problem? Just bring on a new casting director, of course. The irony is that the new casting director, for the most part, just brings in the same people. It may seem like there are a lot of actors out there, but in reality, there's only a small group of actors in LA and NYC that actually get the auditions. The director wants you to walk into the room and show her how this role should be played. Why? It makes her life easier. She's got so many things to contend with, the last thing she wants to do is to tell you what choices to make when creating the character. Furthermore, during the audition, she may be thinking, I hope this actor doesn't ask me any questions about how to play the part, because even though the studio is giving her $50 million to make the film, it's her first feature. She's previously only shot music videos and never had to direct actors at this level. Of course, this isn't always the case, but often it is. It's the performer's job to go in and make big, strong choices, to show the decision makers and your audience that you have a viewpoint, a perspective, that you're willing to take risks and push the limits. Because even if all of your choices don't work perfectly, they'll at least know that you are someone who makes bold decisions early and often. This is your job too. When you are tasked with planning the family vacation, choosing the restaurant and related activities for a first date, interviewing for a job, organizing content for a speech, or any other activity that requires choices, it's your job to make those. Choices expeditiously, with as much clarity and boldness as possible. Show the recruiter that you are willing to make choices and have a strong point of view. Show your prospective love interest that you have a vision, not just of what you are going to do on your date, but of your future also. 
Show an audience that you have an agenda and are clear about why you're on the stage and what you're there to do. If you can do all of this while being flexible and adaptable, changing when the situation calls for a new perspective or way of being, you will be a top performer in all aspects of life. I do my best to work this way with the members of my team. I don't tell my director of operations what to do all day long. We set out goals for the year, for the quarter, for the month, and even for a particular week, and it is her job to make the choices that will produce the intended results. For my creative team, we choose the direction and I give them the parameters and the results I'm looking for. I then expect them to make strong choices and produce results. But I don't tell them what choices to make unless they ask for help, then we collaborate and make choices together. It's not complicated. It takes guts. I only hire people with guts, by the way. I'd rather work with someone who oversteps perceived boundaries from time to time than someone who won't put one foot in front of the other. If you don't make choices early and often, it's unlikely you're going to get the kind of spectacular results you want. Choose early, but not always quickly. Follow a few basic rules when making choices early and often. First, so I'm clear, I'm not suggesting you start making a display of activity or make changes when you are really unsure. Your decisions don't have to be perfect. By making them, you learn what works and doesn't work so the next choice you make will be better. In the same way, taking risks is rooted in knowing the difference between dumb risks and smart ones. In his book Blink, Malcolm Gladwell famously popularized the psychological model of thin slicing judgments and decisions based on minimal amounts of data and lifelong experience. Gladwell uses the example of John Gottman, a well-known marriage expert who claimed he could prove, within an hour of observing a couple, with 95% accuracy, if the couple would stay together for at least 15 years. The application of thin slicing to our discussion lies in the scientific basis of the reliability of your own knowledge and experience when you make choices. When you are in a new field or subject area or a totally unfamiliar environment, it makes sense that you will be more deliberate in your choices until you gain confidence. Keep in mind that when you choose early, you are often overcoming reluctance and the fear of making a decision. Choosing quickly is simply making the decision, no matter what the outcome. In the hiring process, for example, the consequences of your choices affect other people and even the viability of your team or business. This decision-making process should unspool until you have met and vetted enough candidates and had other stakeholders interview the finalists. Rushing this sequence would be fast. Making the offer as soon as you are confident you have enough data and are comfortable would be early. I just hired a new assistant. She was willing to go through a two-month interview process. I made the choice of whom to hire slowly, but I chose to bring on a new assistant early. I didn't wait until I was so far into the weeds that even the best executive assistant in the world would have a hard time helping me recover. The myth of underreparation. Finally, choosing early and often is the heart of the rehearsal process. If you're not choosing, you're not preparing. The best performers in the world are ready to go before they walk on stage. Some may joke around with the prop master a moment before their entrance, others may sit quietly in a corner, and others will be bouncing up and down on their toes to pick up their energy, but they're all relaxed in their own way, and they're ready to go. They've rehearsed effectively, they've made their decisions ahead of time. They're not making their choices during the performance. They're not winging it. As a result of making their choices ahead of time, they're relaxed at showtime. And, more importantly, they're not dreading the performance. On the contrary, they're excited to perform. That may be the biggest difference between performers and other individuals who are worried about their performances. Performers can't wait to get on stage. Others are somewhat intimidated, nervous, or even scared about walking up to the podium or looking into a camera, in large part because they're not prepared. They haven't made big, clear, bold choices in preparation for the moment. Furthermore, there are still executives and leaders out there who promote the myth that they don't need to prepare or rehearse because they're so good on their feet. Nine times out of ten, show me someone putting their slides together the night before a presentation, and I'll show you a procrastinator who has not overcome his or her fears and anxiety about performing. 
Having seen hundreds of underprepared speeches, I can easily analyze them for the numerous ways their lack of rehearsal shows through and undermines everything that moment could have meant for them. It takes far more courage to start choosing, writing, and rehearsing early, courage that I know you have today.